Lecture 1.3, The Motion of the Sun. So far, we've discussed constellations, how to locate stars on the celestial sphere using two different coordinate systems, and how to find the angular separation between objects using spherical trig. In this lecture, we'll talk about the motion of the sun on the celestial sphere so here's a uh, snapshot from the Stellarium software showing uh, what the afternoon sky looks like um, on February 1st at noon in 2023. So you can see that we're looking uh, pretty much due south and the sun, yeah, the sun is pretty much due south. That's a little bit um, east of due south. Your book explains a little bit about why it's not perfectly due south due to where you are in the time zone and something called the equation of time. If you could turn off the atmosphere, so, uh, you know, the sky is blue because of scattered light uh, through Rayleigh scattering in our atmosphere. If uh, the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, you could look up, the sun would be in the sky, and you would see stars and constellations up in the night, or up in the daytime sky, because there wouldn't be that scattered light. So, um, you know, it's possible to kind of track where the sun is against the background stars, even though you can't directly see them uh, during the daytime. So this shows that the sun in February is in the constellation Capricornus. You can see actually uh, Venus and Saturn and Mercury are hanging out by it also. The red line is the path of the sun throughout the year. So on February 1st, the sun is right here. Uh, in January, it was in the constellation Sagittarius. In December, it was in the constellation Ophiuchus or Scorpius. In the next month, uh, the sun is going to march across the, the celestial sphere until it passes through Aquarius and then other constellations. So this motion is due to the Earth orbiting the sun. We have a different perspective in space as, uh, as the Earth orbits around. And so it appears that the sun um, is superimposed on different constellations in the night sky just because, you know, we have a different angle on the sun as we, as we orbit around it. Okay, so that red line that we saw in the celestial sphere, the path of the sun, is called the ecliptic. So here's uh, the celestial sphere again. The, we have the celestial equator, the north celestial pole, and the south celestial pole. That's tied to the Earth's rotation axis. I think you all know that the spin axis of the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees compared to its orbital uh, plane around the sun. And so that means that the relative path of the sun on the night sky is gonna be tilted 23 and a half degrees compared to the celestial equator. So again, the that, that blue line now is the ecliptic, that's the path of the sun, and that great circle is tilted 23 and a half degrees compared to the celestial equator. So we're not gonna go into, you know, the origin of the seasons and things like that in detail here, but uh, just say we'll just say that uh, when the when the sun crosses the celestial equator, this happens twice. Once when it's going from south to north, that happens in springtime, on March 21st. That's called the vernal or spring equinox. And then again in the autumn, uh, the sun will pass from the north to the south uh, hemispheres. And that happens on the autumnal or on the fall equinox on September 21st. The solstices are when the sun is farthest north in the celestial sphere. That happens on June 21st. That's the summer solstice. And when it's farthest south, and that's the winter solstice on December 21st. So there's kind of like four points on the uh, celestial sphere that mark the passage of the the uh, equinoxes and the solstices. Here's another way of representing the same thing. This is now a start of a star chart. We have 
declination uh, is on the vertical axis. So zero degrees declination is the celestial equator. Uh, uh, this chart only goes up to plus 60 degrees and minus 60 degrees. Uh, so the very, the stars at the at extreme declinations aren't shown here just because things get distorted on this particular map projection. Um, and then on the horizontal axis is right ascension. So right ascension starts to the right and then increases to the left. That's just because of the direction the celestial sphere rotates. First thing is to note is that on the spring equinox, that's when the sun is crossing the celestial equator from south to north. So that point is where right ascension is calibrated at zero. So the sun will have a uh, right ascension of zero degrees on March 21st every year. So month after month, the sun is marching along the ecliptic on June 21st. It's at its uh, most northerly, northerly position. And that happens at a right ascension of about six hours. Then as you go through July, August, September, to get to the fall equinox, uh, the sun will now have a right ascension of uh, 12 hours. Again, that's gonna happen on September 21st. The winter solstice in December, the sun will have a right ascension of 18 hours. And then back to the spring equinox where um, a right ascension of 24 hours is the same as zero, right? This, this thing wraps around, it has periodic boundary conditions. So here are all the months of the year mapped out. So again, you start at March where the sun is at zero hours, right ascension, and then you're counting through the months, March, April, May, June, all the way to December, and then January, February, back to March. The sun, the position of the little sun here um, is shown at the 21st of each month, since that's when the solstices and the equinoxes occur. Okay, so here are a few examples. So the first example, uh, the question is, in February, what constellation is the sun in? Well, it might be a little hard for you to read the names of the constellations here. Um, I do have a more high resolution uh, sky uh, star chart um, available on the on the website on blackboard uh, so you can look at that if, if you want to if it's hard to read the the, the powerpoint uh, but okay so in february you can find okay there's the uh their sun that's labeled february so the sun would be right here and so you can kind of see well you know it's maybe between capricornus and aquarius in there someplace so right in there, Aquarius or Capricornus, that's easy. You just like use this little chart to answer that. Um, in February, what is the right ascension of the meridian at noon? At noon, the sun, very, to a good approximation, the sun is close to the meridian. So in February, the right ascension of stars on the meridian must be around 22 hours of right ascension. So the, like all of these, you know, stars here at 22 hours uh, would be close to the meridian. In February, what constellations are on the meridian at midnight? Well, if you're looking this direction in space at noon, uh, these, if these are all high in the sky at noon, and now you wanna know, well, what's gonna be visible at midnight? Well, midnight comes 12 hours after noon, so you just uh, count over uh, 12 hours. If you uh, subtracted 12 hours from 22, you would get 10. So, you know, you would just count over 12. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you get to 10 hours. So, so all of these stars along uh, with this right ascension would be uh, kind of, well, they would be on the meridian at midnight in February. So what constellations? Well, you can kind of look 
So this constellation right here is Leo the lion, and then Hydra the sea serpent kind of goes along through here. So Leo and Hydra would be high in the sky at midnight in February. And that's very easy to figure out if you know what the right ascension of the sun is um, at that time of year. Um, I've also tried to sketch in a little diagram kind of showing you the boundary between what's going to be up in the sky and then what's going to be below the horizon um, at midnight in February. So the shaded in area is stuff that's going to be below the horizon. You can't see it. So obviously you can't see the sun at midnight. So that's below the horizon. Uh, and so it looks something kind of like this. So all these stars up here would be high in the sky and they would be something that you could look at through your telescope. Okay, so here's another example. What month is best to view the center of our Milky Way galaxy, which is in the constellation Sagittarius? So here's Sagittarius. Uh, Sagittarius has a uh, right ascension of about 18 hours. And we can see from the diagram that uh, the sun is in the constellation Sagittarius in December. So December would be a terrible time to try to look at the center of the Milky Way because it would be up in the sky during the middle of the day and you can't view the stars in the daytime. You have to wait till night. So December is the worst time to view the Milky Way in Sagittarius. Uh, so the best time would just be six months after or before that. So six months from December is June. So you can just like count the little stars here. There's there's like one, two, three, four, five, six. So six months from December is June. And so when the sun is over here, now Sagittarius is going to be on the opposite side of the sky. And so that'll be high in the sky at midnight. So the answer is June. So you have a very similar question. What if you wanted to observe the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy M87? That's in the constellation Virgo. So here's Virgo. It's kind of over here. And so you can uh, kind of make a stab at where you think the center of this thing is going to be. Uh, try to estimate what the right ascension is and then try to figure out what the best time to observe uh, that galaxy would be. Okay, uh, in the next lecture, we will talk about solar and sidereal time.